Due to inclement weather in our area, we are a bit delayed on our podcast. It was raining, then it turned to sleet, then it turned to hail, then it turned to snow. But unlike our horrible North American weather, we're going to look at the tropical island of Grenada and the U.S. invasion of it in 1983. Hello and welcome back to the Cleocast, the podcast where we just talk about whatever we feel like. I'm RC. And I'm Matt. And as Matt said, our topic for this week is Grenada and the uh, invasion of, so let's just get right into it. For context, Grenada is a Caribbean island just a bit north of Venezuela, and it is near the lower Antilles of the set of islands. It's nowhere really close to what you think of as the main Caribbean, your Jamaicas, your Cubas, but it is still in the region, and it has a similar history. Discovered by Christopher Columbus, well, not really discovered because it did have peoples on it, uh, but discovered during his third voyage by the Western Christopher Columbus, he still thought it was India, by the way. Um, it became a hot spot for colonization, just like most other Caribbean islands, with efforts to grow many different things on it, which would result in Grenada's top export, even into the 1980s, being nutmeg. Nutmeg was extremely popular in the 1700s and is a popular spice today, but really, Grenada's main economy, uh, being based off of nutmeg, has really no interest to the United States. And that is something that Ronald Reagan said in early 1983, as if situations in Grenada ramped up higher and higher, and that is the geopolitical topic that we will touch on today. After the United States successfully revolted and freed itself from the yoke of British imperialist oppression in the late 1700s, they began to see themselves as more of a protector of the new world, if you look at it from a very America-centric point of view. In 1823, President James Monroe, in his State of the Union address, began to kind of quantify the idea of the old world staying out of the new world. As many countries in the Western Hemisphere had started to have revolutions and throw off their colonial masters, America, Mexico, to name a few, Brazil. This was later called the Monroe Doctrine. It wasn't at the time, but the idea was simple. All of these countries that had been freed and had independence gained would not have European masters reassert their dominance. Granted, there were still some European nations in the area, such as Spain still owned Cuba, as it would for another, you know, about 100 or so years until the 1890s. And I'm sure the Europeans, such as the British owned islands in the Caribbean and, you know, Bahamas and whatnot. But effectively, the Americas were not ready for another colonization attempt. America asserted that it was the master of its domain and Europe was not to interfere. This remained the standing policy of America for pretty much until today. I mean, the, we've never really de-asserted this notion. We've kind of had moves in recent years, but it hasn't really been anything concrete. It was really solidified in 1948 when Franklin Roosevelt, after the Second World War, established the Organization of American States to effectively solidify all of the Americas together in one at least organization that could kind of commingle and prosper, though of course America would be at the head of it. Although the Monroe Doctrine might, in the ideas of an American, free the Americas as a set of continents from European colonialism, it doesn't free any other country from American domination and American imperialism, which is something that would be really pointed out when uh, Theodore Roosevelt goes to build the Panama Canal or uh, the bulk of banana republics that would be formed by American companies to just establish their own, uh, you know, just horrible, horrible plantations to grow uh, bananas to go up to the American market. It's a shame that that's how it went down, uh, but with the growing age of the Cold War, 
it turned into one superpowers playground into uh, two superpower playgrounds as the Soviet Union, as they are at the height of their power post-World War II, also start getting involved in uh, inner American politics with sponsoring a bunch of uh, communist groups and the most successful uh, communist-backed government that would develop in the Americas, Cuba. Cuba would go through its own revolution to uh, oust the, uh, some would say, American puppet, uh, but definitely a dictator, uh, to establish a communist government under Fidel Castro. This would lead uh, down the road to the Cuban Missile Crisis, but also a bunch of other uh, American-style attempted executions. There was also the Bay of Pigs. These were all failed actions of American imperialism. But, you know... Uh, you can't really win them all, but one that you can win is if there is another communist revolution in 1979. The New Joint Endeavor for Welfare, Education, and Liberation, or the New JUUL movement, if you like acronyms, were a largely Marxist-Leninist organization established in 1973 as kind of a party in Grenada to you know, push for better rights for workers, better welfare standards, education. Altogether, you know, what communists, marxist leninist movements usually do is push for better living standards for people by any means necessary. In 1979, they launched a color revolution against Eric Gehry while he was out of the country on a visit to the Commonwealth of Nations national meeting. They... Spent a few days seizing, you know, various military outposts, radio stations, you know, everything you need to successfully overthrow a government. And they were largely successful in this endeavor. Eric Geary was out of the country. There was no direct chain of leadership within the country. So the new jewel movement succeeded. They were able to form a new government and take control of the country. They formed what they called the People's Revolutionary Government of Grenada, and they would be in control of the country until 1983. So the new government of Grenada uh, soon accepted military advisors and also uh, foreign and economic advisors from all the different countries that were uh, more left-leaning. This is the Soviet Union, this is East Germany, this is Bulgaria, and this is Cuba. Cuba is one of the most important countries that I would highlight in this because they are the uh, largest communist Caribbean power in the area. They share a similar region, and they uh, now recently share uh, opposition to the United States. This wasn't exactly a problem to the American government at the time. Uh, one, this was an election year in 1979, uh, as it approached the 1980 election year, where uh, the current president incumbent, Jimmy Carter, of the Democratic Party is running against Ronald Reagan, the former governor of California and former movie star. This wasn't really a major focus. This is, I uh, think, right now, today. If you're sitting and it's, you know, March of 1970, well, March of whatever year that you think of, do you think that you would really hear news of a Caribbean coup? Uh, and would you really care? Could you even point grenade on a map? That's the questions that goes on in most Americans' head and really wasn't a major blip on any radar of the U.S. government at the time. It didn't really become a problem until the uh, military and foreign advisors were pushing for more aggressive military uh, intersection uh, into the standard life of the average Grenadian person and also the bulk of... American students that would go to med school there. It is a common practice for med students to uh, attend, you know, med school in the Caribbean. They have actually pretty good uh, med schools. Uh, Cuba is actually pretty famous for their ability to produce high quality doctors. This is uh, something that if you're looking for something you can't really get into an American med school, look to places like Grenada. But those schools uh, have a bunch of Westerners, and usually, as the accounts that uh, people who were at the school say, they were around Cubans, there were Cuban students and Cuban military advisors, and they, you know, talked. They had a softball league, but really they avoided talking about politics. This would come to a head in 1983. For context, for the rest of the story we're going to get into, uh, 
Grenada is about the size of Lincoln, Nebraska in area. So the area that the city limit of Lincoln, Nebraska is, is similar in square miles to Grenada. Grenada is about 130 square miles in actual land size and has a population of, uh, a current population of about 112,000 uh, people. But in 1979, it was sitting at about 88,000. Uh, that population would uh, rise uh, steadily uh, to 1983, where it stood at 96,000. But this is a very small area. So when we talk about these operations and when we talk about the length of it, uh, don't be surprised. This isn't like a massive desert storm storming a large country like Iraq. This is a small Caribbean island that has a interesting history when it comes to this recent event we're going to talk about. On the 16th of October, 1983, Deputy Prime Minister Bernard Coward orchestrated a military coup, seizing power from the People's Revolutionary Government and New Jewel Movement head, Maurice Bishop. He was placed under house arrest, and this was a very unpopular move with the people of the country. It caused mass protests. People were very happy with Maurice Bishop, or at least happy with the status quo, and very unhappy with a second coup within four years. Now, Maurice Bishop was able to use this dissent and protest to his advantage to escape house arrest, but, you know, with Bernard Coard in charge of the military and in charge of the government forces, he was able to find Bishop within a matter of days. He had him executed summarily, without a trial, by a firing squad, along with multiple government officials loyal to him and his partner. Hudson Austin then stepped in. He was the leader of the military itself. He formed a military council. He was in charge of the country. He put Governor General Paul Schoon under house arrest, who was attempting to lead before him. There was a four-day curfew then in effect because of the mass protests over this second coup. And the military ordered that anybody found out on the streets after curfew was to be shot, summarily executed without a trial. This is understandably a very harsh punishment for being out after curfew. I don't think anybody probably listening to this can imagine something like that. And obviously, this was not a very popular move with the people of the country. They were already protesting over the multiple coups that had uh, ensued, overthrowing popular leaders with unpopular ones, and now to be executed simply for being out on the streets, regardless of your political motives or your you know beliefs or whether you supported the governor or not, that might have been the step too far. Back to the American students at the med school. There was uh, quite a few of them, and uh, with this new military coup, the school was now surrounded. Water was cut off, and really they weren't allowed to leave the school. It, the military is claiming this wasn't a hostage situation, uh, but when you can't leave something and they say you're free to leave, but also uh, we might shoot you, those are some mixed messages that would much uh, rather seem like a hostage situation. This was not good uh, for these American citizens, and it wasn't good for the people of Grenada, who did not want this and uh, were having issues with the new government. Now, uh, this communist government has been left virtually alone by the United States until this coup happened, in which uh, Ronald Reagan... Uh, was unwilling to take this laying down. Operations were soon planned in secret, but in the idea of uh, Ronald Reagan's public appearances, it was, we may, we may not. And that's what he told even our allies with the conservative government, uh, Margaret Thatcher being the prime minister at the time in the UK, that's what she was also told. Now, this is a good time to also remember that Grenada used to be a British colony and is a part of the Commonwealth of Nations, which is a mutual trading and defense pact established between Commonwealth nations who were formerly a part of the British Empire and Britain alone. But we'll get to that point later. 
So U.S. operations took over, and the main plan was to use U.S. Army Rangers to uh, do airborne operations to secure the airfield, to secure the prison in which political prisoners are being held, uh, who were mainly lower members of the former uh, government that were, you know, although in a coup, the legitimate government of Grenada, and to secure the American students in the university. So that is the main operational plan. There would also be Marines landing to support them at two different beachheads, and they would move in and then basically cut the island into two and then split out. This ran into problems because on on the 25th of October, 1983, nine days post this coup in Grenada, the U.S. military operation was a go. HR was at 5 a.m., but the airborne troops are going to drop specifically the 75th Ranger Regiment to take, take over at the International Airport and the 82nd Airborne Division, which was going to land, uh, were delayed. And they didn't jump until the morning, which is bad for airborne operations because now they can see you. You don't have the element of surprise. And it, it was announced on the radio, the national radio of Grenada, that they could see U.S. troops coming and to repair for the attack. The element of surprise was gone, and the element of the darkness that comes from early morning jumps was also gone. This was a problem, but the jump still went ahead, and they were able to get on the ground and begin to secure the airport and also start moving towards uh, the university to free the students. This is also a fun fact. Uh, this was the first time they really used uh, the newer style American helmets that weren't the M1 good old uh, iron bucket that was so iconic to the Vietnam War and World War II and started wearing similar helmets that are worn today. But the issue is that kind of looks like a Stahlhelm from uh, World War II and the Nazis. So the 75th Ranger Regiment, which is some troops were assigned to wear that helmet were told to wear it very very loose with the camouflage to cover up the actual sight line of the helmets so it didn't seem like oh here's our you know american style ss american style ss special forces jumping onto the island so that is a fun little fact but now, after the airborne troops dropped, the Marines started landing to go and push their way closer to the capital at the bottom of the island in Grenada as uh, as more Marines near the top of the island split it off. It was a half Special Forces, half Marine Corps joint operation to segment the island and secure it from the People's Revolutionary Forces that were going to put up a relatively stiff resistance for what was actually expected. The U.S. forces were plagued by inadequate intelligence along with the inadequate logistics. Uh, also, maps were not exactly that great for U.S. troops, but still operations were a go. There were troops on the ground. Uh, there were about 1,500 Grenadian soldiers who were mainly had small arms, but they did have some Soviet-style personnel carriers and armored cars to meet, which is a difficult situation because usually airborne troops do not have anti-armor capabilities to really tackle that situation, which is why uh, the naval invasions with the Marine Corps, SEAL teams, and more Ranger regiments were extremely important for hitting those armored vehicles and also any entrenched position that the grenade military could establish. Now, this was a uh, major operation with quite a lot of aircraft being used, uh, but the issue is, is when you fly low of a helicopter, you could get hit by a dishka, which was a Soviet machine gun, basically the Soviet style of the M2 Browning machine gun, referred to as Madus. This is a problem when, especially when a Marine uh, AH-1 Cobra gets destroyed, but the operation continued moving forward as they plan uh, to segment the island quite along the southeast mile or mountain and this plan was also referred to, uh, even though it was really quickly, it was Operation Urgent Fury. So 
U.S. troops invaded on most of the flat parts, and uh, although facing stiff resistance, uh, they the Grenadian troops were no match for uh, the overwhelming force, especially coming from the USS Guam, USS Independence, and the might of the United States military. This is important because this is part of Ronald Reagan's effort to shake off uh, the idea of the Vietnam War. There was this Vietnam mindset that came with the American people and the American army. And this is where we need to get into a sidetrack to a man from the 1700s in Germany. This is Karl von Clausewitz. He wrote a book called uh, On War. And it focuses on a, uh, think of a triangle. And at the top, there is the people. And on one corner on the bottom it is the government. And then on one corner on the other bottom is the army. You have to have an equal balance of all three in order to maintain military operations. Now, uh, what happened in the Vietnam War is you lost the top part of the triangle with the people. And that also started to cut off part of the government as Richard Nixon did Watergate and everything started to fall apart. And then the army, even though some people in the army, particularly higher ups, wanted to pursue it, the ground troops also uh, were not into the idea of the Vietnam War either. So you lost control when you start losing parts of the triangle. Ronald Reagan's attempt was to rehabilitate the American psyche in uh, military combat situations. And he is actually the person, if you ever see those uh, POW MIA things where it's the guy, the white silhouette in the background in the prison camp, he's also the one that perpetrated uh, that idea. And he's the one that actually had uh, federal buildings fly that flag outside of it. But uh, this is part of the effort to rehabilitate the American uh, idea and also save some Americans at the same time and reestablish a government in Grenada that was, uh, although more American-leaning and not as communist as uh, it used to be, a, at least it was semi-democratic, and uh, this would lead to the establishment of October 23rd, the invasion of the uh, island of Grenada, becoming Grenada's Thanksgiving Day, to thank uh, the United States for invading. But that isn't the case right now, because the United States uh, had to deal with the intense political backlash that came from this. The UN immediately called a special emergency meeting to discuss that the United States' actions in Grenada. The British were pissed because Margaret Thatcher only received, we may or may not, which was a very wish watchy answer, only hours before, and then only five hours before was told straight up, yeah, we're going in. That's not enough time to repair, and they were invading a country that was a part of the Commonwealth of Nations. So that's an even bigger situation. The Soviet Union, one of the permanent sitting members of the UN Security Council, denounced this, uh, claiming that this was bringing barbary back to the world and that the modern era uh, is not about these kinds of just gutless invasions. But when Ronald Reagan was asked about it, he was like, it didn't ruin my breakfast. This is really bad for looking at internationally uh, because... In order to be the superpower of the world, you have to play both internal relations and uh, public relations in the international world. And meeting drastic, almost blanket condemnation for this invasion, even if later on it benefited the people of Grenada better, this is still ruining uh, a bit of reputation that the United States has, but there would be more operations in South America and eventually uh, leading to the complete break of uh, Soviet Union so the United States could continue doing these types of operations leading to the Persian Gulf War, the first one, and the second one in which we would see kind of similar things. But you also see uh, these type of international combination in, uh, not to get too political or modern, uh, with Russia today. So... That is the story of Grenada. I'm going to go ahead and uh, I went on a bit of rant here. So I'm going to go ahead and tap my other co-host in and let him fill in a bit more of the details. Casus belli is a very old concept, but it is a very important one. It's effectively Latin for the justification of war. 
you have to have a correct reason before you can go and invade your neighbor, right? You can't just say you want Levens Rom, you know, living space. That that's not a valid reason. You know, you have to be a threat or you have to be invaded. And in the modern era, it's pretty much defensive or nothing. And see, the Korean War and the Vietnam War, even if you disagree with the reason, at the very least, the United States had a reason to go in there. South Korea and South Vietnam. They had another nation that was being invaded that they could say, hey, this is the reason we're going in. We got to protect these guys. With Granada, it was more abstract than that. I mean, there was a coup, but there are coups all the time and we don't invade. We didn't invade Iran in the 50s when they overthrew the Shah. That wasn't enough reason. And we didn't invade in the 70s when they took they took a bunch of embassy members hostage in the Iran hostage crisis that polluted Jimmy Carter's electoral and presidential campaign. What I'm getting at is effectively, as long as you have a justification, it things are a lot cleaner on the international scale. You know, you don't have the widespread condemnation that you did for this. In fact, you can get people to help you, such as the first, uh, you know, Desert Storm, the first Persian Gulf War, when we got a bunch of nations to help us invade Iraq because they were invading Kuwait. See, we had a good justification for our invasion of Iraq. And I guess kind of similarly with, you know, the Afghanistan War, once again, agree or disagree with it we at least had some form of a reason, which was, you know, 9-11 had happened, so we wanted to get, you know, uh, Osama bin Laden. Not getting into the politics of whether that was justified or not, there was a justification, see. With this or with the current invasion of Ukraine, just to bring it into modern events a little bit, there's not as much of a justification. I mean, it's all like ethereal, you know, it's fabrication, right? Uh, I guess college students are being threatened, and I guess there was a coup, even though the U.S. had never really invaded for either of those reasons beforehand. This is just a good illustration of that point, effectively. While the U.S. ostensibly did have a reason, and they did kind of get some popular support from the people of Grenada, clearly internationally this was a very unpopular move. It was seen as a return to, you know what Europe used to be with colonization and imperialism and how, you know, it's the divine right of nations that are more powerful than their neighbors to police them and to do with them what they will, you know, may the strongest survive. And that kind of goes against what America is about. You know, we market ourselves as a anti-imperialist country that, you know, fought off the chains of the oppressors you know, the British Empire, and we're trying to foment the new world as this, you know, bastion of freedom and democracy, which, you know, you can disagree with that, but that's at least what, you know, the ideals of this country were founded on. But this is not that. I mean, this is the U.S. invading a country and coming up with a reason. And, you know, it's not really that kind of thing here. This, this is the beginning of the United States kind of starting to really go against its core ethos, you know. Vietnam, Korea, those were all things. This is just a pretext for invasion that we had to come up with. Lastly, to wrap out this podcast, I would like to point out the heroic actions of Gunnery Sarge Sergeant Thomas Highway. Nearing his mandatory retirement from the Marine Corps, he finagles a transfer back to his old Marine unit, the 2nd Reconnaissance Battalion of the 2nd Marine Division. He then trains them to prepare to fight in a war that he is used to. This man was a hardline veteran of two wars and taught people how to survive, especially new Marine recruits. And as someone who understands this situation, helped win this little battle in Grenada. Now, this tall, handsome man, uh, who also goes by the name Clint Eastwood, would end up uh, having a box office success, earning $121 million in 1986 for the movie Heartbreak Ridge. So, this is a hero you definitely have to look up to, and this is uh, one of the only little bits of media 
that's extremely popular about the invasion of Grenada. So if you're curious on the American perspective on the invasion of Grenada, check out Heartbreak Ridge. And this is it for the Clio cast. We will see you next time. My name is Matt. And I'm RC. You can go ahead and follow us on Twitter at Clio History. And you can go ahead and email us at uh, corecasters.com. You can check out our ACAST. And we'll have uh, more content coming for you soon. Thank you so much. Goodbye.